This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. The question for today, will there be a new election in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District? Shortly after Republican Mark Harris declared victory and Democrat Dan McCready conceded, the Elections Board refused to certify the results. Allegations of election fraud began to seep out involving vote harvesting that might potentially have benefited the Harris campaign. McCready withdrew his concession and went into finger-pointing mode on MSNBC's Morning Joe. Day by day, more evidence roll in, more affidavits roll in about actual fraud uh, and criminal activity. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it really doesn't look good, and it goes to the very top of, uh, of Mark Harris's campaign. Mark Harris, meanwhile, has said very little, but he did say this. The integrity of our electoral process is the heart of our democracy, and we must protect it. If this investigation finds proof of illegal activity on either side to such a level that it could have changed the outcome of the election, then I would wholeheartedly support a new election to ensure all voters have confidence in the results. And it may come to that. Yesterday, Dallas Woodhouse, the executive director of the North Carolina Republican Party, announced that the state party chairman, Robin Hayes, will call for a new special election. But state Republicans are doing so with a heavy heart. Because the losers would clearly be the 286,000 people that cast legal votes that are not in question. We know from special elections of the past that many of those people will not return to vote in a special election dealing with just a congressional race. Losing those legally cast votes is a dark day in North Carolina. It is an atrocious result. However, the most important thing is that people in the 9th Congressional District have confidence that the person that represents them in Washington is there with the support of the voters. But that decision is up to others, and the question becomes what that decision will be. Will they agree that a new election is necessary? If so, where? Justin Bladen County, the epicenter of this alleged fraudulent activity, or the entire district? And if we and if these shenanigans took place in the general election, might they have also influenced or changed the outcome of the Republican primary? Will we also have a rerun of that contest? The big question remains, who will be the next congressman from North Carolina? Carolina's ninth. Harris, McCready, or Robert Pittenger? We are in uncharted territory here, and we will explore all of the possibilities and some other topics with three political experts for the hour. Dr. Michael Bitzer has become the national political science face of this election debacle and his frequent appearances on various cable TV news shows, but he has humbled himself this morning to return <laughs> to where his career as a pundit began. He, of course, is a professor of political science. <laughs> <laughs> Political science. I can't even get it out. Uh, yeah, it's, it's. At Catawba College. Welcome back. Thank you for saying the name of the school correctly. You're welcome. You're I head, appreciate that. Your head fit through the door. It was yes. A, a, a remarkable thing to see. <laughs> Dr. Susan Roberts held a similar position at Davidson College. Welcome back to you. Thank you. I'm a wannabe That's national right. pundit. <laughs> and Steve Harrison is a longtime political reporter and has <clears throat> brought those skills to us here at uh, WFAE News. Welcome back. Thank you. If you'd like to join our conversation, you can email us at Charlotte Talks at WFAE.org. Get to us through Facebook or on Twitter at Charlotte Talks. Just how unprecedented uh, Dr. Bitzer and Dr. Roberts is all of this. Have we ever had this happen anywhere with a congressional election? Not, not with a congressional election in this state. No. This, this, this is unprecedented for modern North Carolina political history. We've seen it at perhaps at a local level, sheriff's races, uh, but nothing of this magnitude at this level of a uh, federal office. What about elsewhere in the country? Well, I think, you know, it's uh, we look at uh, Chicago and we think of vote buying, vote mm -hmm. machine, voting machines, urban machines. But I don't think we have this at least as we can detect. And one of the things that we look at uh, election fraud, ele you know, voter fraud is how we define it and how we detect it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'll make this point later that it's not it's not it's not v about voter ID. And it's not about voter fraud, although there may have been some voter fraud in this. It's f fundamentally about election fraud. What's the difference, Steve? So, excuse me. Um, so voter fraud, we usually consider that when someone um, 
impersonate someone else to cast their vote. And that's been the whole focus of photo ID in the uh, constitutional amendment and the legislature. I think th- there's no real evidence that anyone tried to impersonate one in this case. It's it's a it's a uh, election fraud in that the 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 ballots, the absentee mail ballots, were Ill- illegally harvested. Um, maybe changed by a third party, maybe discarded. So I think that's kind of the uh, um, – there is a difference. Yeah. And uh, But but if you are a person knowingly if, – if, if, since this has been going on in Bladen County for a while, and perhaps you've been asked before to just sign a ballot, a blank ballot, and give it to somebody, you are knowingly participating in the fraud, one would presume. Does that then become also voter fraud on your part? Or does, or does it matter at this point? We're just picking at straws here. I, I think that if if somebody – you have to understand the intent of the person. And if the intent was, as you laid out, the idea that I'm just going to sign my ballot and hand it over to somebody and they can cast the ballot for me, mm-hmm. that would be crossing that line. I think for this, it seems like from all that we know at this point, and we have to make that clear, is – Voters were were filling things out and handing it over with no malice or or intent to manipulate. It was somebody else, as Steve said. It was a third party attempting to manipulate the outcome. And I think I think it's important too that that the rules on absentee mail ballots are confusing. And I think yeah. like before sure. this started, I think everyone had to kind of like read up on what's allowed and what's not. And so I was in uh, Bladen yesterday, talked to a woman, and she was like. Oh, yeah, this is McRae came to my house. Just he came. This is what every time, every time, uh, every time. And, and, and it's, it's the way it's done. It's the way it's, it's done. done. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it, you know, and they did have this kind of outreach effort in Bladen County of like trying to alert people like it's your ballot. You can't get it right. up. But but it's it's confusing, which which points to what Dallas Woodhouse, how Dallas Woodhouse, the executive director of the Republican Party in North Carolina, characterized this as a cultural corruption problem. And he's been making rounds of TV news shows and he saluted the media yesterday for bringing daylight to this problem. And also yesterday he passed along uh, words of praise for the media from party chairman Robin Hayes. Chairman Hayes would like to thank the media in the Charlotte region, across the state, and across North Carolina, as well as outside the state, for uncovering and reporting on what has been a systematic failure to deal with rampant political corruption in that part of the state. Is this a new approach toward media on the part of Republicans? (laughs) Well, at least from the from the top, it is. Yeah. But um, I think he was talking about earlier. It's way beyond uh, the outcome of the election. Right. And Harris had said earlier, if uh, this would uh, lead to uh, a change in the outcome, then I'm all for having a new election. So this that, may that's o- not the standard, though. But this no. may this may overturn uh, the election of a Republican person going to the House. It may not, but it may. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 it's and Republicans are ones are the ones. It seems who are leading the charge on on this on because he said the people responsible for this Dallas Woodhouse said need to go to prison for mm-hmm. a long long time have we finally found an issue that we can dispense with partisan politics on maybe this is bipartisanship maybe it is yeah. bipartisanship to ensure the integrity and the confidence in the electoral system but also the fact that if this is indeed systemic if this is indeed long term that this kind of behavior has been going on it could also be a bipartisan sense of yeah. corruption and north carolina republican state <clears throat> senator tommy tucker held a press conference last week making no bones about this being a systemic problem in bladen county and what needed to be done Bladen County has had a long history of absentee ballot fraud, even in both parties. So we are being once again embarrassed in this state that our elections don't count and people's votes don't count and all votes should be counted and we need integrity in our elections in North Carolina and it needs to be done in a bipartisan, transparent and expedient manner to get this issue resolved. The governor, we believe, needs to establish a bipartisan task force to investigate 2018 election in Bladen County and any irregularities and every other allegation of voter fraud 
in Bladen County, even back to 2016. And former Governor uh, Pat McCrory has said that he might have won had it not been for voter fraud in Bladen County against uh, uh, Governor Cooper. Is that why they want to go back to 2016 to check that out? I mean, I think the governor, I, I think he said, like, well, there weren't enough absentee votes in Bladen to make a difference. The McCrory wanted to use Bladen County two years ago as kind of a... Um, yeah. Like a wedge issue to uh, then like, well, let's investigate absentee everything. fraud across the state. So he knew Blaine wasn't enough, but he wanted it to keep going. So there have been calls for a new election. When we come back, we'll talk about the implications of that and how that might be done on Charlotte Talks here on WFA. Members in Charlotte concerts presenting the Vienna Boys Choir performing Christmas in Vienna at CPCC's Halton Theater on December 19th at 730 Tickets and more information at charlotteconcerts.org. And from Donald Hack Diamonds, offering a holiday selection of fine jewelry available both in store and at the Moorcroft Shopping Center and online at donaldhack.com. Now with delivery service to the Charlotte area available. We'll get right back to the show in just a moment. You rely on Charlotte Talks for important conversation about what's going on in your community. We rely on you to help pay for everything else that we do at WFAE. Consider supporting Charlotte Talks right now during this year-end membership campaign. Give online at WFAE.org or call 704-549-9000. Thank you, Mike. We do hope that you will call in and contribute a portion of your budget right now. We are restarting our fundraising campaign today after uh, taking a a brief pause as the winter weather descended upon the Charlotte region. I have a $1,500 goal for this hour of Charlotte Talks. A few contributions in already from Joe, Alexia, Cecilia, and Margaret. Uh, I'm going to quickly tally how much they've contributed to let you know the remaining balance towards that $1,500 goal. In the meantime, I do hope that you will recognize how often you turn to this station uh, and then uh, decide how much you can contribute to support us. Uh, My name is Jeff Bundy. I'm here live in the studio right now with Marshall Terry. We're going to be going back to this uh, conversation, uh, this Charlotte Talks conversation about the 9th Congressional District just as quickly as possible. Can you call in and support us right now? Can you afford to do $10 a month? If you can, we'd love to say thank you by continuing to bring you Charlotte Talks in 2019. We would also like to say thank you by sending you the new uh, I Heart NPR Dog Leash, which you can see at WFAE.org. Uh, we need to hear from you. 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. Again, our goal this hour, $1,500. Still need to raise a little more than $1,000 to get there here in the next 40 minutes. Uh, $1,041 to be exact. And we can slowly uh, chip away at that if we hear from you. $10 a month will we'll go a long way. 704-549-9000 or WFAE.org. If I can make a request, Marshall, I would like to quickly chip away at that. We're trying to finish this fundraising campaign as quickly as possible. Um, you know, after pausing the campaign for a couple days because of the snow, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get things restarted. It's like, you know, if any of you are runners out there, you know, like once you hit a good stride, you hit a good pace. If you had to like stop and then like get your legs really cold, it's not as easy to get start going uh, going fast again. That's kind of the situation that we're in right now. We're trying to you know warm ourselves up, uh, reheat this fundraising campaign, and we're trying to raise as much as we can just as quickly as possible so that we can finish this campaign ideally by Friday. Can you contribute a portion of your budget right now at 704-549-9000 or WFAE.org? Our ability to wrap this up on Friday, uh, as we hope to do, is entirely within your hands right now. You listening right now have the power to help us in this uh, membership campaign by Friday or perhaps earlier if we hear from you right now with the pledge in any amount. 704-549-9000, again, the phone number or WFAE.org. Uh, we've thrown out $10 a month if you can be a little more generous, uh, $15 a month or $20 a month. Thank you for that phone call. We'd love to hear from you. If you can afford $20 a month, we'd love to send you the Charlotte Talks t-shirt as a thank you gift you can see that and all the other t-shirts that we uh, have available at the same price level $20 a month at WFAE.org go ahead look at all the thank you gifts look at all the content that we have provided in the past uh, just few weeks and months then go ahead and make the decision to become a member WFAE.org 704-549-9000 we're going back to the conversation in about a minute yeah uh, one minute to go here until we rejoin the Charlotte Talks conversation on the 9th Congressional District Uh, we're paying really close attention to that story. Steve Harrison is one of the guests. He's our political reporter. He's one of the guests on Charlotte Talks uh, today. He's been doing the uh, the circuit, you know, contributing to, to national programs as well as working hard here at WFAE. You're helping to fund his work. You're helping to fund uh, the hard work of Mike Collins and all of the producers behind the scenes at Charlotte Talks. We're asking you to contribute what you can. You know 
that you're going to tune into WFAE tomorrow. You know that you're going to tune in later this week, later this month, next year, and you know that you're going to have very high expectations for us. Will we meet those expectations? Will we be able to continue to bring you the services and content that you expect from us? We need your support and to allow us to do that. We are honored to have your support. We're honored by the nearly 1,000 people who have already contributed to WFAE. We want to be as strong as possible going into what will be a very busy 2019. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. The aforementioned Steve Harrison is in our midst here uh, at uh, on Charlotte Talks this morning to talk about the situation down in Bladen County, along with Dr. Susan Roberts from Davidson College and Dr. Michael Bitzer from Catawba College. The more we uncover about what went on down there, and it has been going on for a while, the worse it looks. And yesterday, state Republican leaders expressed concern that Bladen County election officials may have broken state rules by counting early votes on Election Day. Democratic leaders have alleged that those counting those votes allowed outsiders to view the results. And it it is that, not allegations of mail-in ballot harvesting, that has led state Republicans to call for a new election. The leaking of the early voting numbers would be a competitive advantage that would likely take us over the threshold that we had set all along of there being a question of the outcome of the race or possibly a substantial likelihood the race uh, could be overturned. That is a standard that we have believed is important for the state when it comes to calling for new elections. Let's talk about that standard, because early in this process, when it was first confronted with the possibility that something had gone wrong, mm-hmm. Mark Harris, the Republican winner in this primary, at least in the initial election, said he would be willing to have a new election if it would change the outcome. That's not the standard. Not the standard at all. I will cite yeah. North Carolina General Statute 163A-1181. When can new elections be called? The state board may order a new election upon agreement of at least five of its members in the case of any one or more of the following. Mm -hmm. And number four says irregularities or improprieties occur to such an extent that they taint the results of the entire election and cast doubt on its fairness. Tell me what a level of taint and doubt is. I think we are, if not reached it. We are well on our way to reaching it. And and the way this has been positioned by the various sides and all this has been morphing. It's been changing over, yeah. over the last several weeks. Is that simply because we're finding out more or because there was a cover-up initially and they didn't want to admit it? What's been happening here? What, what have been the various uh, excuses? So two weeks ago when this first broke, kind of the state Republican Party's view was um, <clears throat> the race needs to be certified. Mark Harris won. We can investigate after that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then about a week ago, it shifted to um, if the result would have changed, we can hold a new election. And Dallas Woodhouse at the time, his view was, um, hey, harvesting ballots, it's not good. It's illegal, but that doesn't really change the election. We need to see that they were changed. And then over yesterday, after the, the news that the early vote was run, over the weekend before the election, you know, then they kind of shifted. And I think part of that was, I think there's a sense now in the state Republicans, like, please make this go away. Yeah. I'm, I'm, why are the Republicans, the Democrats have been very quiet about this. Why have the Republicans been leading the charge? Well, and I'm very surprised, uh, as Michael and I were talking earlier, that McCready didn't seem to have any idea. It, it looks as if we started with, are there third parties involved? Then is the party involved? And now it looks like both. And the, the narrative has shifted from um, that's a bad election to uh, the party will will help to now we're doing it for the integrity of the process itself and transparency and it's a little difficult to watch that unfold and something different will happen tomorrow there'll be another story is it beyond belief that the Republican Party didn't know uh I think it is uh questionable because is it beyond think- belief that the Harris campaign didn't know Well, here's what I'll say, and that is every campaign, at least even down to the sheriff's level, has – Uh, is hiring consultants. That's across the country. That gives maybe someone plausible deniability. And get out the vote is the essence of that. But I think if you look at some of the reasons that um, uh, they were hired, um, 
I think it, it means that something was going on. And I think it does mean that you can't put a fingerprint on some of this. But it, as Michael said, it casts doubt on the fairness of the election. And as Susan teaches campaign strategy, I teach campaigns and elections. And we talk about in our classes the role of campaign consultants. It is a profession. It has developed. But you don't do these kinds of things without somebody within the campaign knowing about it. Well, some uh, campaign consultants have been known in the past for their dirty tricks. And in fact, that was the modus operandi of Lee Atwater, who started all this back sure. in the 80s, uh, uh, who said, the, the, and I've said this a thousand times on the year because he told me this in the makeup room of South Carolina <laughs> Educational Television when I did a talk show with him years ago, the ends in politics, the ends always, always justify, justify the, the means. means. So if you are a candidate, be you Democrat or Republican, and you're hiring a consultant, and most of them do at a certain level onward, mm -hmm. does the buck stop with you? Are, are you the one responsible for what ultimately transpires in your name by a consultant that you may never meet? I think in integrity of somebody seeking public office, yes, the buck stops with the candidate, and the candidate knows who his ham campaign is hiring and has had some past experience and in the, with individuals. And I was going to say, and the, the Washington Post did a good story um, last week about kind of Robert Pittenger's role in this. And, and in that story, Pittenger had said, or his people had said that he considered hiring or was offered McRae Dallas's right. services. Offered, McCray, offered. Offered. And he sat <laughs> down with him and then it said, like, you know, I don't really want anything to do with this guy. And then I think in that story, it talked about his people kind of begged them to hire him if only to do nothing. Pay him to do to just to sit so that he wouldn't work for the other wouldn't side. Wouldn't work for the other side, and uh, and then because he's been known to work for both sides. Correct. Yeah. 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 So philosophically, if the buck stops with the candidate, and you've said yes, and there is taint in the election because of the person that you've hired to campaign for you, should you withdraw? I think that's a decision that only the candidate can make. Well, I'd also point out, too, we've spent a lot of time uh, in looking at elections and talking about the damage that campaign finance does and the super PACs and the PACs. And this gets us down to brass tacks, what goes on within the campaign. And um, if in a race like this, it's not a local race, but a race in a congressional district, we're not talking about the president. They have an intimate relationship with the campaign manager and perhaps I would think the consultant as well. So uh, there's an old phrase, and it might be from Shakespeare, methinks thou dost protest too much, meaning that you might be protesting the thing that you are guilty of mm -hmm. yourself. And Teresa on Facebook says the Republican Party has been hand-wringing over voter fraud for years because they know what they are up to themselves. Their crocodile tears over this are nothing to see because they have only themselves to blame. Cheaters never prosper. Anybody want to comment on that? Your mother always told you that to tell the truth is much better than the being caught in the lie because every lie uh, is like an onion and un unpeels. But I think the Republicans have been talking about voter ID. and Has um, that been a distraction or a deflection or a, 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 a yeah, distraction? Has it been way? Don't look over here. Look over here. Well, I don't know if it's been a distraction the whole time. I don't think. Yeah, because I don't think we knew about this at this scale. At they this did. level. They did, because, no, they, in Bladen County, the Democrats and the Republicans have, 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 and, have and participated and benefited from this, evidently, That That is true. Years. That has happened in the mountains as well. I mean, it is at the local level something endemic within human behavior. But to, to be so focused on concern about the electoral sanctity and the, the process and the integrity and the confidence and to ignore what is going on here— um, begs the question. So getting back to what uh, uh, they've been saying about uh, letting somebody come in and count the votes early and, and other outsiders <clears throat> seeing the votes, which led to the call for a new election. Is it okay to count those votes early if no one, if no one outside the process sees them? It, would that be legal to count them early? I think they can only count them starting maybe on like after PM. election after seven thirty when the polls so they counted maybe, them the week before or it was I think the weekend before right okay. right and so the idea is that that it's leaked and, and of course the word gets around you like okay this is how we're trending this is what we need to right. do but it's interesting like I talked to uh, 
the leader of the Democratic Party in Bladen yesterday, and he was kind of more concerned. I mean, he was still more concerned about ballots and what happened to him. He kind of, you know, looked at the um, the early vote run as as a big deal, but not something that would be such a monumental change. That was his view. Um, so it was wrong to count the votes when they counted them because it was too soon to count them. Mm-hmm. It was certainly wrong to let outsiders see them. Who were these outsiders? Were they members of the Republican Party, member of the, members of the Harris campaign, members of the Democratic Party, a, a mixture of people from the Republicans and Democrats who just came in to watch? Who are these people that saw them? Do we know? Well, I'll have to say that I don't know. Right. Um, and I think that may be a fair question for all of us. Has I think any, I think the investigation. I think the state board of elections, through its nonpartisan staff, mm-hmm. is trying to find that out. Well, this has been referred to prosecutors in the past, and Dallas Woodhouse referred to this yesterday with a great deal of anger in his voice about how nothing ever happened. And I've, we've been saying this on this program for for two weeks now. That the question is why it's been referred to federal prosecutors, and nothing ever happened. Why not? And can law enforcement? Should law enforcement be held responsible for their failure to act? I think that questions of the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of North Carolina need to be asked. Uh, there, there were ref, uh, referrals made in 2016, is my understanding. And we did hear about a subpoena, a massive subpoena, early in the fall for voting records. But I understand it got pushed aside until after the election. And that was all – and those – you know, that big subpoena in the Eastern District was all for the, – I think that the, the focus there was on non-citizens voting, kind of right. the, the – which is – more Which of is the not photo ID in person, yeah. completely right. different from absentee mail. What was it about this, this election? Because this has happened before, evidently. What was it about this time that made people sit up and take notice? I think it was two weeks ago yesterday when the State Board of Elections announced it was not certifying. The vice chair then made the comment, there are issues in the area that I'm from mm-hmm. that raise concerns about this election. And that tipped me off to say, start looking at the data to see what trends there are. And I think that's where things really kind of just snowballed from there. It felt like it's been feeling like. Well, and I won't get into all the numbers, but when you see the percentages of the absentee ballots requested, the numbers of those returned compared to other parts of the state, that makes you look beyond just um, where do we think this is going in terms of, of the result? Because I don't think the result really, the 905 votes really signal, let's, that's really close. Let's see what we can do about it. I think you could make an argument that all of the absentee mail action or scheme in Bladen County added to Harris's vote total, but you could probably make an argument if he ran the re- ran the election without that, mm-hmm. he still wins. We don't know, but you can make, ar- make the argument. You can make the argument. He's going to get yeah. some absentee It's a votes. Republican district. Yeah, he's going to get some votes on his own without help. State Republicans have uh, called for state officials to take control of the, the redo of this election, if there is one. Uh, what have Democrats said? I think Democrats are are pretty much, you know, staying quiet because this is a Republican based issue at this point in time. Why? The election. Why is it Republican based? Because the Republican won. You'd have as to, Steve just said, he's probably going to win anyway. Well, you'd, you'd have to ask the Democratic State Party chair, Wayne Goodwin, or, or they others. Are now, they are now kind of digging at Harris on, because, you know, Harris has only released that video on Twitter. Yeah. And, yeah. and they are now kind of pushing back. I think they held a news conference yesterday saying, Please tell us what you knew. So, well, and they, Dan McCready sent out a yeah. list of questions basically asking the same thing. Um, I, I think this election is going to be district-wide. It's not going to be just in Bladen. It's going to have to be across the district. Are state officials likely to take over the election in, uh, because of this and, and, and remove all of the elections boards in all of the I, counties? I, I doubt that, but they will have a very close scrutiny. Of of the county administration. Why isn't the federal government stepping in? This is a federal election. Well, I think Nancy Pelosi uh, the other day was asked about it, and she just really was very noncommittal. It's almost like the Democrats say, pull off impeachment. Uh, she was very noncommittal about back to the states, seat them, not seat them, new election, new primaries, whatever. And I think well, this, this is what the federal government does in, in federal elections. They protect the voters' rights. Why aren't they stepping into this? They haven't said anything about this. I think they want to let the Republican Party uh, implode on its own. Well, and, and I think they, in, in fairness, I think 
think they want the State Board of Elections to have the first shot yeah. in collecting the evidence, collecting the data, col uh, having the evidentiary hearing, and then the feds will see what is going on and if it is indeed a violation of federal law. It, it's better not to look hyper-partisan in this situation on the part of the Democrats. Because you already have this win-at-all-cost mentality, yeah. polarization. And I think the Democrats can maybe smell the the blood in the water, and they're, they're going to let the Republicans and the party try to get out of it. This is not the only embarrassment uh, for the state of North Carolina, as some of the Republicans seem to be purporting. I, I hate to say that as a native North Carolinian. Hmm. Uh, we're going to come back and wrap up our discussion of what's going to happen in the 9th Congressional District. And there are a couple of other things that we'll get into as time allows with uh, Dr. Michael Bitzer from Catawba College, Dr. Susan Roberts from Davidson College, and Steve Harrison from WFAE News this morning on Charlotte Talks. Members and Hendrick Acura offering the Acura Season of Performance event featuring 2019 MDX and TLX models, details, and test drives at HendrickAcura.com. And from Taylor Richards and Conger featuring modern business and dress casual clothing for men, embracing a lifelong philosophy that good taste is always in style, Taylor Richards and Conger since 1986. Details at trcstyle.com. We'll continue the conversation on Charlotte Talks in just a couple of minutes, but first we need your help so that we can continue to bring you discussions on important topics. This is WFAE's year-end membership campaign, and I'd like to ask you right now to make a financial contribution to keep Charlotte Talks strong for another year. Call 704-549-9000 or give online at wfae.org, and thank you. Thank you, Mike. 704-549-9000 is that phone number that you can call or you can contribute online at WFAE.org. My name is Jeff Bundy. I'm in the studio now with Marshall Terry. Taking just a moment before we go back to this conversation uh, around the 9th Congressional District, uh, hoping that you can chip in what you can right now. Uh, we had a, a goal of raising $1,500 by the end of the hour, thanks to good people like Jonathan and Kira, who both called in from Charlotte. Thanks as well to Rick in Charlotte, who made a very generous contribution. We're down to now needing just $301, Marshall, to raise $2,000. Great to uh, have that great uh, momentum because uh, we're restarting our fundraising campaign after taking a pause around the, the inclement weather that we've all been dealing with over the last couple of days. I want to keep that great momentum going. I want to get to the end of this campaign just as quickly as possible. We'll get them that much faster with your call and contribution right now. It's 704-549-9000. Yeah, a contribution of $10 a month is going to go a Thank long you. way. Thank you for that call. A contribution of $10 a month is going to go a long way in helping us keep that momentum. When you give us a call like that good person did, 704-549-9000 or WFAE.org. When you do call in and become a sustaining member at $10 a month, we will happily say thank you with the I Love NPR dog leash, which is new. Uh, it's, it's really cool. You can check it out at WFAE.org along with all the other thank you gifts. Uh, and, of course, we will bring you another year of Charlotte Talks also is to say thank you because that is where your dollars go. They uh, power conversations like the one that we're listening to right now and the very important story of potential election fraud in the 9th District, the impacts that that uh, will have. We are still – that story is still mm -hmm. unfolding. We are still on the story, and we are still on it thanks to your dollar. 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. You know, Marshall said the uh, the contributions that we received in the past powered today's converse conversation. So, so think for a moment what that means. The conversation you're going to tune in for tomorrow is powered by the money we raise today. The conversation that you tune into next week, next year, next month – those are funded through the money that we raise right now. We're $301 away from raising $2,000 for this hour. We hope that you could maybe call in and contribute that full $301. But if it's not enough, if that's too much for your budget right now, uh, you know, call in and do $5 a month. Do $10 per month. A lot of people have called in to contribute for that uh, I Heart NPR uh, dog leash. Why don't you get one for yourself? Get one for the dog lover that you know also loves WFAE by calling 704-549-9000 or donating at WFAE.org. That, again, is $10 a month, but a gift of any amount will automatically enter you into the Winter Wonder gift card bundle contest that we have uh, during this winter membership campaign. Now, that bundle includes uh, several gift cards from area vendors totaling more than $3,000. You'll automatically be entered to win that uh, when we hear from you with the pledge, 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. Going back to the conversation on Charlotte Talks uh, in about 30 seconds, uh, but the phone number, uh, the phone line, that is, will yeah. still be open even when you don't hear us, 704-549-9000. 
$301 left to raise here uh, in the next 20 minutes. Or Correct. So. Thank you for that call. 704-549-9000, WFAE.org. Remember, any contribution gets you entered into that Winter Wonder gift card bundle uh, raffle that we've got going on. Make a contribution as a sustainable. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with Dr. Michael Bitzer from Catawba College, Dr. Uh, Susan Roberts from Davidson College, and Steve Harrison from WFAE News. And we're talking about political stuff, mostly the 9th Congressional District and what may happen next. We don't know what we don't know, and we certainly don't know yet uh, that Mark Harris or even members of his campaign knew about fraudulent, beyond a shadow of a doubt, knew about fraudulent activity in Bladen County. And at yesterday's press conference, in which state Republicans called for a new election, uh, uh, the reporters asked state GOP party executive director Dallas Woodhouse about that. We have seen nothing that make us think that Mark Harris participated or would condone this behavior. We believe it is against his character. We know him to be a good man. That is our only experience with him. Really? Mark Harris is running to be the United States Congressman in the 9th District and that's all you know about him? And you're the party chairman? Really? Is that normal? I'm, I, as, I'm, I'm asking that because I really don't know the answer to that question. I, um I would say let's wait for the evidentiary hearing by the State Board of Elections. Because Dan Harris, I mean Dan McCready rather, has accused Harris of bankrolling criminal activity. Is that being premature? Well, I think if you look at um, the d- d- disproportionate funding, McCready had maybe, I don't know, three or four times as mm-hmm. much money that he had at his d- disposal. And I think then you look at Harris, maybe that, that pushed you to that. To really say, um, it used to be that more uh, elections were candidate-centered and there wasn't much alignment with the party, and that's changed, uh, especially when you have um, the party so strong in North Carolina. And, and with the parties taking, as you said earlier, the winner-take-all mentality, and it is all about winning, uh, that's, that's where I think we are in this but, but, polarized environment. But, but Mark Harris has now run three races for Congress. He ran against Pittenger two years ago and lost. He ran in the primary against Pittenger and won. He ran in the general election and, at least for now, has won that race. The party knows nothing about him other than he's a good guy. I believe he also ran for U.S. Senate. Okay. And I'll just say that that, that um, I think um, WSOC yesterday, they got a photo at some event of Harris and McRae Dallas, like, standing, you know, one of those pose pictures. Right. Kind of In selfie. March. March and so, this year. you know, and I think there's been others. So I think clearly Harris, it, this wasn't a case of, like, of, because it, it did go through a consultant. But clearly Mark Harris did know McRae Dallas to the point where he inter- where Mark yeah, Harris introduced, introduced McCray Dallas to a prospective city council candidate here in Charlotte. Yeah, that was Eli Portillo. Pert- Eli had reported that. Yeah, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, right, and and so yeah, they knew each other, and yeah. they were you know at they and they were um, they were close, not yeah. close, but they definitely knew each other. Actually, the, I'm looking at the picture right now uh, on my screen here. Um, so now we have two issues. We have the, the, showing the results of the early vote count. Well, three issues. We have the fact that they counted the votes too early, <laughs> that they showed them to uh, outsiders prior to the general election, which could have changed the outcome because it might have incentivized some people to go out and push harder for more votes. Uh, and then we have the allegation of harvesting of votes by various operatives in Bladen County. Remind us, Steve, what harvesting is and why it's illegal. So in in North Carolina, um, once you get your absentee mail ballot, it is yours. You are responsible for it or a family member. Um, That's to kind of protect this chain of custody that no one can intercept the ballot and change it or throw it away. And so the harvesting occurred, I think, pretty rampant, pretty broad scale, where um, people working for for McCray Dallas would kind of collect these, and he'd put them in stacks, and he'd count, like, okay, we've got this many here and this many here, and he um, he kept a tally. Um, and so, um, you know, and then you hear also in Bladen County that there was a big premium, um, that the biggest prize of all was a blank ballot, mm-hmm. a signed blank ballot mm-hmm. where the voter had signed it. <laughs> That, that was that was clearly the most prized possession. Which of these problems is the more troubling? They're all troubling, Mike, because they all speak to the the integrity of the electoral process. I am of an opinion 
that if votes are being manipulated, if ballots are being taken without the intent of the voter being expressed on them, whether they are being filled in for particular offices or whether they disappear, that to me is a serious violation of a fundamental principle Mm. that the voters have the right to speak to our government through a safe and purposeful ballot. Well, and if you pull back a little bit, there's already documented percentages of people that distrust our institution, distrust our elected officials. And if you also pull back a little bit and say, um, have we become jaded to um, fraud and manipulation? And we look at the context of you know low voter turnout, and we look at the Russian <laughs> involvement. Um, people see this and they wonder about uh, the integrity of the ballot, whether they should vote, and who's responsible. It has... Uh, as Michael was saying, really impact of, on democratic norms. Yeah, um, this is not this is not just particular to Bladen County. We we alluded last Friday during the roundup to Rob. Is it Robison or Robison? Rob Robison County, um, uh, because they too had some problems with the, with this election. So they have um, – Robison is right next door to Bladen County, and it's really right next door to Bladenboro, which is the little hub of this. And so they have the highest percent of unreturned absentee mail ballots in the state. Their actual um, – the numbers that they were cast were kind of in line with everyone else. So the question is what happened to all of those votes? And so what we do know is that the Democratic Party was running a very aggressive get-out-the-vote, getting people uh, – registering people, getting them to vote by mail – and also, at the same time, the Board of Elections there was overwhelmed with how many new requests they were getting. And so, were those ballots intercepted, or did the whole operation to get people to vote early and vote by mail, just did, it fall just, apart. did it just not happen? Yeah. Well, and I think also to look at the context, um, Politico had an article, and I think I, I disagree a little. It said, distrustful, desperate, and forgotten, a recipe for election fraud, and mm-hmm. called Bladen County, quote, um, a petri dish of America's problems. I don't think you can really put that much on and stretch it into uh, these people have been forgotten. The pork industry is 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 uh, not as healthy as it used to be. I think it's it's more than just the people uh, didn't understand the absentee ballot or the people uh, of that county. I think you need to be more fair to those people because we like voting to be convenient. It's pretty convenient if someone comes to my house. Yeah, the uh, state elections board will meet on this on December twenty. First, what will they be well, deciding? I think that they will hear uh, from their professional nonpartisan staff what the evidence is, and then they will have to make a decision, I think, either to certify the election and say that Mark Harris won or not certify based on one of the four criteria and call for a new general election in the district. Will, uh, I I believe subpoenas have been uh, given to the Harris campaign or various individuals in it. Will this continue to be investigated, whether or not there's a new election and whether or not Mark Harris runs in that new election and whether or not Mark Harris wins that new election? I would say in the... So I would just say in the subpoena, I mean, that the, the absolute uh, worst thing that would come out of it would be correspondence or emails that talk about the early, the, the tally of harvested votes as we, as you know, like two weeks before the election, like we've got a hundred next day, we've got 150. I mean, that would be absolutely when, devastating. When was it around. known and who knew it? Um, Dan and McCre- is, is there a paper trail? <laughs> Dan McCready is already raising money for this new election. Uh, not that he needs any. My, my God, he had more money than anybody in the in the last election. But he's raising money. So will this energize the base? And if so, this new election. And if so, which base? The Republicans or the Democrats? I think uh, Democrats certainly will be energized and mobilized. Uh, I, I would agree with Dallas Woodhouse. The, the likelihood is turnout will be lower than 52 percent from what we saw. But in a, in a really? new election, yeah. yeah. But won't people want to send a message, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat? There's a lot of confusion I, there, in general. There's a lot of confusion about this. And, and to your point earlier, there's a lot of distrust. Okay. And, they, and some people will say, you know what? They messed up the last time. I'm not going to give them the luxury of giving them my vote. And where does Robert Pittenger figure into all of this? Can he come back and say, I was robbed? I want to be part of this, too. 
only if the U.S. House of Representatives intercedes and calls for an entirely new election cycle. And what's the likelihood of that happening? Because they've already said they're not seating anybody from the 9th Congressional District until this is resolved. I think once the state board has their hearing, you're going to hear the U.S. House of Representatives get involved after January 3rd. So if you were on the campaign staffs of either of these two candidates, what would your message be in this new election? I don't know what Harris's message would be, um, because he's got to talk about, uh, they've been uh, discussions that now he's has been the darling of the Christian right. You might want to get out uh, integrity and ethnic, uh, ethical procedures, but that really is, is very problematic. And Dan McCready might say, I was, you know, it doesn't matter the outcome, even though it was slim. I want you, he can, ha- he can bring out all the democracy and integrity of ballot kind of rhetoric. And that would be what I think his message would be. I'd, I'd concur. I think, okay. you know, the the righteous indignation is on the Democratic side if, if all of these allegations prove true. So because in, in light of this uh, uh, election fraud, it became necessary for the voters to vote on a constitutional amendment for voter ID. <laughs> and voters said yes, and the legislature got to work <clears throat> finally writing the law after we said yes. The law has been written. I believe it's passed the legislature. It's gone to the governor Governor's for his signature. Or veto. Or, or his veto. His veto would be meaningless because it will be overridden because it will happen before January, mm-hmm. correct? So what does this final bill contain, this voter ID bill? My understanding is that it has uh, considerably more uh, forms of voter ID. Uh, you can use uh, yeah. university uh, as well as private if, if private schools meet certain standards that the state sets. People who go to Davidson, people who go to Catawba could use their ID to vote. Is the governor likely to sign this or follow the request of the ACLU and Equality NC and Democracy North Carolina who are asking him to veto it just to make a statement? I would have to think he'll veto it, but I don't know anything for sure. Uh, the Democrats in North Carolina are also taking a new approach in challenging Republican-drawn legislative districts, which have been gerrymandered to favor the GOP. What is this new approach? My understanding is that we're we're dealing with the court case from uh, earlier in the campaign season, and we will be revisiting all the congressional district lines with a trip to the U.S. Supreme Court. But they're also challenging, instead of challenging, I'm, I'm told, with this suing in state court, instead of challenging congressional lines, they're going to go after legislative lines in yep. hopes that they can have more Democratic influence in the legislature when the legislature draws new lines again in 2020. Because because of the census, right? Is that likely to happen? So there's yeah, there's two tracks. There's a, a a state lawsuit over the legislative state legislative seats, and then at the federal level with the congressional map, um, waiting for the Supreme Court to weigh in. So with the whole ninth district, like this could change. You know, you have to redraw it by tw- after the 2020 census, but before that next year, the courts could make them redraw it. So I think there's just I think so. This th- is four tier four-dimensional chess going on. Wow. Yeah, and it's and the Brennan Center, this is going on in, in at least 15 states across the country in terms of lawsuits that are going on. And again, if people don't know the shape even of the ninth, think about all the confusion. Uh, you know, people have confusion about the issues. They have confusion about the shape of the district. They have confusion now about where does my ballot go. Break out the popcorn. Politics has become entertainment. <sighs> Movie and television entertainment. Dr. Michael Bitzer, political science professor at Catawba College. Dr. Susan Roberts, the same at Davidson College. And Steve Harrison, political reporter for WFAE News. Thank you all for the hour.